Hello and welcome to the last word on Spurs. We do hope you're keeping very, very safe and well. Thank you ever so much for joining us for this special feature edition of Last Word on Spurs. As I think we're on our 155th manager here as we try and get ourselves together here. I'd be going for the last six, seven years, but it does feel like we're racking through the numbers here. As Macca once called it a crazy train, quite literally, at one point the wheels are falling off. But we look like we might be putting them back on. If you're listening to the show for the first time, you can find us on iTunes, we're on Spotify, we're across all major audio platforms. We're, of course, on Twitter, at Last Word on Spurs. We're on Facebook and Instagram too. And joining us on this Last Word on Spurs, look, you know them by now. We've got our wonderful regular returning panellist the Last Word on Spurs. We've got the crazy instructor, conductor, tier one, I can call him of Last Word on Spurs. Lee McQueen's in the house. Macca, love to see you back on, mate. Yeah, really good, mate. Tier one. Do, do not even worry about that, people. Uh, 7th of April, I called it, and today it is confirmed that Ange Postelogu? Yeah? No? Postacoglu. We, can I just say, there was a, a, a lot of people, a, a lot of people have Postacoglu. said beforehand, guys, if you're going to come on and do a podcast, at least get the bloody, name, the bloody guy's name right. <laughs> so, Lee, you've got <laughs> between now until August to nail this, mate, or between I'll be, now I'll and be the weekend. i lessons from you and, and Ant. Right, so I'll God, get it. no wonder, we'll no wonder why we're screwed. We'll get it. Um, look, all Lee's, jokes aside, Lee's turning um... into my dad. You, you are my dad. <laughs> yeah. Getting the Bodgkins. name of, uh, uh, yeah, he's got Bodgkins all over again, isn't it? Yeah, totally, totally. Look, I mean, it's great to be here, Rich. And uh, look, finally, I think it's seventy-one days officially from March the twenty-seventh. Somebody in the in the in the comments would do the math until today. So uh, Spurs do like a record. We got one. It wasn't the seventy-two days broken, but we got the first Australian to ever manage in the Premier League at a top-tier football club. And all of the non-Spurs uh, fans that are in this group right now, start laughing if you want, but you can out yourselves as well. So you're, you are listening to a Spurs podcast after all. Um, look, now, all, all banter and jokes aside, um, I'm, I'm pleased. I'm pleased that we've got somebody in. It's 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 exactly what we needed in terms of to be able to try and get behind someone. He wasn't my first choice, um, um, as it he wasn't for, for many. But the reality is, is the choice of Tottenham Hotspur custodians. Whether or not that's right or wrong, I'm sure we'll get into that. But it's not his fault. As Jason said, it's not his fault. And he's taken the job and we've got to get behind the bloke now. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I have to be honest with you, for everything I read, for everything I listen to about him, it's, it's hard not to like the bloke. Whether Absolutely. he's going to do a good job, it's I don't know. But but I'm, yeah. I'm going to back him all the way because he's our manager now. So he's going to wear the, the, the badge and we'll see where we go. Yeah, absolutely. Back on last one on Spurs on a little, I would say, bit of a bit of a annual leave, if you want to call it that. For him, he's probably enjoyed the therapeutic nature of it all. But we've rushed him back probably quicker than what he wanted. But he's here. We've got the wonderful Richard Cracknell back in the house. Rich, how are you, bud? Very well. Evening, uh, Lee and Patrick and viewers and listeners further down the line. And uh, yeah, I'm all well. Hope everybody's uh all well and uh yeah today the uh the search is finished 72 days 73 days whatever it is of extensive research didn't want to rush it sure they didn't ask anybody else to do the job and uh and, and have got their man so you know Tottenham and the ball doing their absolute due diligence as they always do and uh here we are so but I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit more as the uh, as the evening goes on, but as long as everybody's all well and all good, I'm loving the backdrop, Rick. By the way, loving yeah, I that. mean, do you know what? I thought I'd go just so I let people in a little bit. I thought I'd go with a kind of Greek theme for you here. Um, I'm at the in-laws at the moment, so I did make that joke in the last show that I've been my wife for uh, I think 1974. Although we, it could be over by the end of this weekend, depending on how many podcasts that we do record. Um, but this is currently meant to be the second of the week. Who knows where it might go? But after being with over 15 years, uh, there would be no doubt about it at some point. Spurs would finally land on what you would say is a Greek manager, Greek slash Aussie manager. So I'm all for it. And it was going to happen at some point. I've got the wife, the kids. So here we go. We're going full circle, cracks. Rick, Rick, just as a quick aside, is he? does he identify more as an Australian or more as like a Greek Cypriot? This, not that it's, you know, it's for the birds, this one, but it'd just be interesting to see... 
like what how he how he sees himself or a little mixture mixture of both. So these my these un- types of things yeah. fascinate me because my lad he he now identifies as Canarian more than more than British well, does he? Like from does living he? here. Yeah, he does. Yeah, 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 yeah he's he's very much you know British passport but Canarian heart. So and these things these things interest me. My and understanding is he's a, he's a Greek national, right? Greek national. Yeah. But he obviously then opted and moved over he to talks, Australia. He talks quite passionately about the the situation around immigration with his parents and what his parents yep. had to give up in order yep. to get mm. over to Australia in the first place to get his children a better life and that and that type of stuff. So I, I think he probably still does think of himself as Greek uh, because of that. Okay. You know, because he is right. Mm. He mentioned that. the sort of, listen. The man knows his stuff. He mentioned the sort of laggy. Anybody out there? I'll give a shout out to Desiree Blue Olive wherever you are. Those restaurants in Cockfosters in London. They cannot be waiting for. Anne to step through the door of what's to come their way. My Desiree God, like... and Blue Olive. I went to a, I went to a bar a few weeks ago, and Desiree and Blue Olive were, were dancing around the pole. But <laughs> anyway, that's that's for another day, Rick. That's Carry a different on. one. Definitely, definitely. Different day, different show, probably. Making up our panel tonight. Loads of him back on. My God, he's been stirring the social media. I would say trolls, you'd say, today. He's got them in uproar as to what's going to be coming out of his mouth in the next hour and a half. We've got the wonderful Patrick Tyrant back on last one on Spurs. Pat is a regular. I'm not sure if you want to be a regular after this show. Pat, how are you, bud? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. And yeah, I mean, yeah, my um views got caused quite a bit of a stir because I'm probably going against what you guys think and say. And obviously we'll get into it. But to be fair, I'm good. Um, I'm built for it. Nothing I can't handle. I do want to say good evening to all the Spurs fans tuning in. Good afternoon, depending on what time zone. Good morning if you're listening to this tomorrow on your work commute. And yeah, happy to be here. Can't wait to chop it up. I'm glad that the managerial search is over. I'm not too happy with the appointment, but we will get into it. I am going to remain positive. I want the best for Spurs, which means I want the best for him. But I do feel we should have went down another avenue. But I will get into it. So, yeah, all good. I must. Add, I just want to say that before we start the show that I always consider last one on Spurs as a you know as a as a platform that this is brought to you as close to the terraces as possible. All the guests that you see on this show. Uh, the contributors, even the viewers and listeners, these are guys and girls that go to Spurs week in, week out. They have an affinity with the football club. And I've always made that point that for me, you want to be hearing from genuine fans that go week in, week out, that have a desperate dying love for Tottenham Hotspur and ultimately want to see the club do well. That's irregardless whether you're in favour of the owners or if you're not in favour of the owners. You know by now, by listening and watching last one on Spurs, there is no topic that is off limits. We cover absolutely everything on this show. I know Jason McGovern cannot wait for the transfer shows to come. God bless him. He's right. getting involved, mate. Getting involved. Will, uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, I was... Uh, listen, if anyone saw me today on Sky Sports News, they did try and kick me off with a cricket. I love all Jason was in control of the control panel there. But look... We are going to get into this. Thank you so much. Already over a thousand of you across all of our platforms listening and watching here to last one on Spurs. Lee, let me open up with you. Tottenham have confirmed the appointment of Ange Postacoglu on a four-year contract. The 57-year-old becomes the first Australian to manage in the Premier League. He will officially start on July the 1st, but we understand he'll now be consulted on all football decisions from this point onwards. Ironically, the search took exactly 72 days again. And a lot of people have maybe complained that Pastor Coglu's CV isn't the most glamorous or the most exciting, despite the fact that he's actually won wherever he's been. But what's really come across to me, Lee, and I'll be doing my research and listening to podcasts and watching videos about him, is that he's an incredibly working hard man that has almost craved an opportunity and an acceptance to be having a prestigious role like this. And he's been afforded to that in terms of Tottenham Hotspur giving him that. So this is a man that I think has waited very patiently to reach the top level. I just want to ask you, Lee, personally, how you feel about the appointment now and Poster Coglu is the new Tottenham Hotspur head coach. Well, look, welcome, Ange Postoloku. <laughs> We're going to have to work on this. We are going to have to work Honestly, on this. Welcome, Ange. Right. Look, like I said at the top of the show, and I think I said in the show that we did a couple of days ago as well, like he wasn't, everyone, you must be living in a cave if you watch this show when I'm on it, because I wanted Pochettino back. Um, and I'm not going to go full circle and say, oh yeah, I don't, don't care about Poch, I want I want this guy in. Um, but I also generally do believe that we don't we don't need a high octane, high, high um, uh, win now manager today. What This football club is broken. 
and we need somebody to come in and help us fix it. And I think for somebody bringing his big cuddly arms around the players, the big cuddly arms around the fans, big cuddly arms around the football club itself to get everybody working in that way, it, it's really strange that some some of you think I'm talking absolute rubbish, and Patrick will probably kill me for this uh, in a bit or, or batter me on on it against his, on, on his views. But sometimes sometimes you it's not rocket science what you need. Sometimes you don't need somebody who's really amazing technically or whatever it might be. And I'm not saying Ange isn't, but what you sometimes just need is to put smiles on people's faces and get people just pulling in the right direction. And Spurs at the moment have been tearing everyone apart. We tear it, the fan base tears each other apart on social media. We're tearing into the board at any given opportunity. We're tearing into the players, get them out, booing them. Emerson Royale coming on at Crystal Palace earlier in the season, being booed. I mean, this is just, a, you know, it's toxicity, uh, uh, not at the highest level, but it is high. And if we haven't seen that before at Spurs, and we do need a good, a feel good um, factor. We, that's why I wanted Poch. I think Poch was the best man to come and do that stuff. But like I said at the top of the show, like you've just said, when you actually do your research, when you actually go and read about him and listen about him and all the journalists and uh, the people we have on the show as well have, 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 have fed back, his story is very compelling. Like, it is very, very difficult not to like the guy. And and, and actually, just because you like somebody, you don't like someone, don't mean to say he's going to be a fantastic football manager. That we'll have to see. But what you can do is, based on facts, this isn't, for me, this isn't, wasn't about appointing somebody on a CV. You know my views on CVs. Pointless. You need to be hiring people based on behaviours and common value to the, where the football club is. And we don't know where we're going. Or we didn't know where we're going, what our vision is. And that's the bit that still riles me, regardless of who's coming to the uh, into the role, as, as Crackers was alluding to earlier. But the, the but the fact of the matter is that we can't do anything about the appointment. He's here. It's not his fault. Let's get behind him while we can and see if we can unite this fan base and this football club to try and push us. Because as Patrick said as well, and as we all want, all of us, every single one of us, regardless of what your views are, we want Tottenham to be successful, don't we? And, you know, whether or not we're, you know, lucky that I'm not running the football club, right? But if would I have gone for um, for Ange? No. But, but it, it was quite obvious to me that we were going to go for him, hence the tweet and the banner about tier one and whatever, because of the ties and because of the working relationship that he's had, we've all screamed for the for the board to change the football inside of the club. And now I, I, I don't want to give them credit because I get battered, but now they are putting put, uh, uh, things into place to change the football inside. You, you've got to kind of run with that as well. And Scott Munn, he doesn't officially start work, as we know, until July the 1st. But Scott Munn's got... This has got Scott Munn written all over it. And that's how, it's got to be a good thing, hasn't it, lads, viewers and listeners? Because if the man's come in to run the football inside, he's actually getting his decisions. That's what we wanted from Daniel Levy, isn't it? To, to step away and let somebody else do it. So that would be my positive spin. I think look, the, the, the negative side or the... Well, I'm still open, where I think you're sitting on, Rick, and maybe crack as you are as well, is that... We don't know if it's going to work out. Does it feel like it doesn't feel like another Nuno to me? I wasn't excited by Nuno no, like one iota, but I have yeah, to I say, totally the more I yeah. read and the more I listen about Ange, I am getting, I am buzzing a bit more for it. I have to be honest. Yep, I do think any form of a change does bring with it almost that up that element of excitement cracks coming over to you. And you know, it's interesting. His mantra at Celtic was, as it became, we never stop. He's a man that, from what I've done research on, he's known for his relentless and attacking style of play that Celtic fans have described as thrilling, but it can also be exhausting. But I think what is very, very clear is that given the nature of the contract, which we'll come on to in a second, is that we are going to need to be patient during what may be another rocky start. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think we've seen that with some of the managers that haven't always been at the time flavour of the month. We saw it under Martin Yole. Maurizio Pochettino, that not necessarily these managers do hit the ground running. So therefore, by the nature of the contract and by the commitment from Tottenham to him, it feels like they're going to be giving this man time to try and rebuild this football club. How do you perceive and feel about the overall appointment cracks? Well, I'm, I'm really 50-50 on it, Rick. I have been all the way along for all the reasons that Lee said. Um, listen, Firstly, foremostly, and most importantly, I'll back him 100% as our manager because this is our football club. Despite 
everything that goes on, the antics in the ballroom and what we all think about that. This is Tottenham Hotspur. I've been going since the mid-70s. I'll never be anything other than Tottenham Hotspur. So now there comes a point where you have to put everything aside and, and just go, you know what? This is my club and I want what's best. If other people that you may not want at your club get some reflected glory from that, so be it. But you want to see your club doing well. Um, listen, I really like him. Uh, I like I like what he represents. I like his values. Um, but I, I have a reservation, Rick, that he might be a little bit from a time that in football that doesn't exist anymore. You know, it's um, the way he sort of speaks and deals with players. I actually really quite like that. It sounds like some of the managers from when I speak to the chaps doing the Legends Night from the 70s and the 80s and maybe even up to the early 90s. Um, and I just wonder that if he comes in with this same mindset, wh wh how he's going to be perceived by these players. I I just wonder if this players committee are going to say, you know, oh, yeah, OK, thanks. Yeah, I've seen you enjoy your lunch speech and uh, and everything that goes with that. But I just don't think that resonates with players of today. So there, there are some out there. there. There are those players out there. So I think when he comes in, he's probably going to have a fair amount of pushback from a fair few of the players that maybe perceive him as a little bit, you know, oh, he's, you know, he's, he's, you know, he's a bit of a, a bit of a Harry Redknapp type, if you like, um, you know, he's that man management, that sort of big arm round type of thing, rather than that technical. Pep style manager, who I do think has got that in him as well, that sort of man management thing. So, look, we're going to have to be brave as a fan base because I think we're going to have our asses handed to us on a plate a few times to start with. I, I, I really do. You've got a, a set of players from three or four different managers. Um, they've got a muscle memory of playing under Nuno. Jose and then um, and uh, Conte. So you've now got to rewire them players to go from being dull, ultra defensive in the front foot, go get them players. So that's going to take some time to get across as well. Um, there's going to be those that don't want to be there anymore. So they've got to go. We can't get rid of everybody that needs to go from that team in one window. That's probably four or five windows. That's probably getting up towards the end of the, of the contract he's been handed today. So this really, you know, we are in such a mess on the playing side and players out on loan and players from this manager and that. This is going to take a good long while to unpick. So we are going to have to be a few games, as I said, where we might take a few four or five one cuffings, five, two cuffings, you know, they, they're going to come. Are we as a fan base going to give him that time? Uh, I hope so. I, I really do hope so. Give him every chance to do that. Um, the more importantly, will the board back his decisions? Because I can see between now and Christmas, he will probably be looking and he'll see those players and he'll think to himself, you know what? You ain't for me. And I don't yeah. think he's going to be that frightened in telling them. And then they are going to be, you can't speak to me like that. I'm going to see Daniel. Yeah, that's so, got to stop. Right, that is that, got to stop. That, that is, has to stop. That has and, to. Because any of those players that go in and see Daniel, oh, Daniel, uh, Big Ange just told me this. Daniel just needs to look up and say to them, oh, did he? Shut your door on your way out. And uh, go and speak to your agent if you don't like it. So everyone's got to be a little bit brave here. Um, you know, I'd, and then there's the risk of can he actually come down and work in the Premier League? Because, you know, we, there's Celtic fans in the comments saying, 
how much they enjoyed him. But listen, let's let's be honest. And I love going up a few times. I've been up to Scotland. I've been up and seen Celtic play a few times. Those fans, absolutely first class. I first went up to Celtic in the mid to late 80s. I went up there where uh, it's, it's an incredible atmosphere, an incredible place, incredible fans. So he's used to that fan pressure. Don't, don't get me wrong, because they, they, they expect, they expect and they demand, but they're only really playing Rangers, aren't they? That's everything else. Two is, team league, isn't it? Yeah, it it's, is, a it's a two team league. league. So it is a massive, massive step up for him. I really wish him luck. I really, yeah. really do wish him luck, but I, I have my, res I do have my reservations. I really hope I'm proved wrong, Rick. I really do. I hope I'm coming on here in Christmas and going, that club's now unrecognisable from a year ago. It really is. And that's seeing what I players to... with smiles on their face. That's I just really want to interact with that before you go to Patrick, because you made some outrageously good points, uh, Crackers, as always. But I, one of the, I was on BBC Radio London yesterday with uh, with Aaron, um, as you know, Rick, and uh, he asked me the question, do you think Dan Levy and Scott Munn have given Ange the target of getting top four? And, and, and that goes back to the point that Crackers is saying is that actually, are we going to be able to stomach, not necessarily the fans, the fans have already been stomaching rubbish results, haven't we? We've seen rubbish football for the whole season. It's, it's you know what I mean, Pat? But it's it's the it's the, it's the the board being able to stomach the fact that when we go and get turned over, I know there's a Villa fan in there, so I'll give you the, the we go up to Villa and we get turned over 5-2 by Villa or whatever it is, or, or we get turned over 3-0 by Brentford because we're still finding our feet and we're far away from the top four. Is Daniel then going to interfere again and and pull the trigger on it because that's the bit that can't happen like we we, we have to stomach it anyway as fans don't we right but it, it's, okay. it's the interference part what i am yep. still skeptical on and all the points you made about him coming down from scottish league and all that sort of stuff of course but yeah i think pat, what is the target then, that's that's the thing isn't it i agree pat there's an air excitement as to what's going to be coming out of your mouth now because we always build it in suspense as to what's going to be coming out of pat's mouth um, what I would say is that, look, I think we said this on the last show, and Jason had an absolutely wonderful point that you could argue that ultimately a lot of feelings will maybe be deciding how he does do in those first 10, 11 games, 12 games, whether maybe we'll be facing Maurizio Pochettino's Chelsea in there, which sounds absolutely weird for me to say that. But Pat, they come over to you. Look, the thing about Postacoglu that I've seen from research is that he's always maybe felt like an outsider with an element of that he's got something to prove. Early on in his career... I read that he felt he was unemployable and wherever he's been, he's had a number of doubters to win over and also calls to be more pragmatic in terms of his football. But the one thing that has really stood him different to maybe other managers is that he has really stuck by his own footballing principles. He's allowed nobody to change his mind in how he wants the style of football to be played. But there's no doubt about it, Pat, which I'm sure you're going to allude to. Spurs is going to be most certainly his biggest challenge yeah, so how do you see the appointment, Pat? First and foremost, I want to say that I am a Spurs fan. Obviously, I bleed for the club. I love the club. I'm an honest fan. I speak my mind. Sometimes people won't agree with it, but I always am honest and true to myself and I speak my truth. And obviously, I always want what's best for the club. So today, when I put my tweet out and it got a lot of criticism, I think I lost about 50, 60, 70 followers. I don't know the count per se, because I don't obviously know to the number. But what I will say is that if you did unfollow me because of that, then that's cool. I don't really want snowflakes. Pat, for those people. that aren't on Twitter, do you want to let us know what you said? Yeah, for those so, that my tweet, so obviously when, when Posta Coglu was announced, my tweet verbatim said, so disappointing, so underwhelming, so uninspiring. So Brentford, Crystal Palace or Fulham FC, dot, dot, dot. And before you tell me to back the manager, that goes without saying. I always want the best for my club. Hence why I'm so disappointed with this C-class gaffer and an emoji thumbs down. So to be fair, I'm just being honest. I'm speaking my truth. I will obviously outline why I said this. And um, for, OK, let's start at the beginning. I'm happy that we now have a manager that hasn't gone on through the summer. It hasn't become embarrassing. We have time now to obviously go after our targets, get rid of the dead word and the players that we potentially don't want anymore, potentially end on belly, bring him back into the fold. Uh, he'll work closely with uh, Scott Munn, which is good news. And we can obviously close that saga and that chapter and move forward. Um, in terms of the managerial appointment, yeah, I am disappointed. The reason why I'm disappointed is because 
when you talk about the initial stuff that the board said to us, they said we want we wanted a young manager, a hungry manager, someone who obviously you know can set a rebuild and be here for the the guy's fifty seven. So that already goes against one of the things that they told us. So I'm looking at that like, hmm, okay, cool. They gave him a four year contract, so I give them that. That means he's probably got the time to really get to grips with the rebuild and start from the bottom up and you know because to give him initially it was talks of a two-year contract so that again raised a lot of eyebrows because two years of an option of three doesn't really indicate that they trust the guy to give him four years okay that means that they really are going to back the guy because to get rid of him now it's going to be a lot of compensation isn't it so it looks like they're going to back him but if I be honest, again, when I put my tweet out, a lot of people, the first thing that lazy comments or naysayers said was, oh, do your research. I take it you don't know much about the guy. Of course I know about the guy. I won't tell you that I knew so much about him before he was linked to Tottenham. I didn't. I knew who he was. I'd watched him in the Champions League. I watched Australia now and again. So I knew of him. Obviously, when he was linked to Tottenham and the links intensified, I did do my research. <laughs> I did a lot of research. Like I've got literally got pages and pages of what I looked at why I obviously made my notes up exactly and I thought it was really condescending that people are telling me to do my research just because my view differs from yours it doesn't mean that I haven't looked into the guy really got to grips with him and I think for me the worrying thing I think he's a fantastic manager in terms of man management very inspiring I've got all the quotes which I can read out to you guys but I'm just worried from where we are and what we need and I'll without going on forever the Celtic or the Scottish, the SPFL, if we're being honest, it's not the greatest indication of football. So, yes, I know he's got, he did the, you know, domestic double the first year. Then he did the treble the second year. Fantastic. That's really good. But when I look at what he did at the level that we would like to compare it to, because obviously the Premier League is a different kettle of fish and Tottenham per se are a team that is typically in Europe year in and year out. So when you look at, I mean, if you take it back to the Australian team, the Socceroos, when he was appointed in... um. I think it was, well, he was, first of all, manager of the under-17s, then, then manager of the under-20s. Then he took the Australian team to uh, the World Cup in 2014. When you look at the teams that he played, he was unlucky because he's in basically a group of death. So they had Chile, Holland and Spain. Just to break it down, this was in 2014. Off the back of 2010, Spain had won the World Cup. Uh, Holland or the Netherlands were in the final with Spain. So they had literally the first and second team in the world in their group. And then they had Chile, who obviously are a really good team. So uh, when you look at the results there, they lost 3-1 to Chile, 3-2 to, to Holland or the Netherlands. That's when he started to get applauded because people saw, even though they lost the game, they were really brave. They were attacking. They actually went 2-1 up uh, and then they un ended up losing the game, probably because of a lack of quality when it really, when it really mattered. But anyway, they lost the game. They lost 3-0 to Spain. So at the end of the day, zero for three, did really well, but ultimately fell short. Is that is that the measure or the mark of the man? Not sure, but of course it does go to, you know, when you look at the guy, you have to look at everything. Then, ironically, in 2015, they won uh, uh, the Asian Cup. And funny enough, they beat uh, South Korea in the finals. So they beat South Korea in the finals 2-1 in extra time. They, uh, they were winning 1-0, then our guy, Son, scored in the 91st minute. So took the game to extra time. They won it 2-1. So that's really fantastic. He won a trophy of Australia. So you've got to give him his credit. So that was brilliant. Then he um, re basically revamped the team. There was a lot of Asian players. So he uh, built the team up again. Qualified for the 2018 World Cup. Um, for whatever reason, he left before that. So he didn't manage at the 2018 World Cup. Then he went on to the J-League. We'll get into that another thing. But he won the J-League. So that's brilliant. But anyway, let me fast forward. When I look at Posta Koglu and I compare him to the level that we want him to be at and where I can really measure him, it's in Europe. So um, in the Europa League with Celtic in 21-22, they played six games. He won three, drew zero, lost three. Uh, he was in a group with Bayer Leverkusen, Real Betis and the team from Budapest, Hungary. Uh, forgive me if I mispronounced this. Ferenc of us, Ferenc of us, I don't know how to pronounce it. But anyway, so they won three, lost three. So 50% record in, the, in, in um, the Europa League. When you look at teams like Leverkusen and Real Betis, they're good teams. They're the kind of teams that you would expect. They're Premier League level teams that will probably finish in the top six, top eight. The level that we're probably at or the teams that we need to be beaten. Um, they lost, uh, sorry, they beat Real Betis 3-2. Uh, they lost to uh, Leverkusen 3-2. Uh, they lost 
again to Leverkusen for nil, and they lost to Betis for three. Uh, fast forward to this year in the Champions League, where I actually did watch these games live and, and, and in effect. Uh, they was in um, the Champions League, so obviously after winning the year, uh, the league last year, uh, Posta Kogli was in the Champions League this year. And um, again, when you measure the team and you look at uh, what they did in Europe... Let me ask you, Pat, for, for those yeah. that are asking for justification, because Spurs, of course, aren't in any form of Europe, are you suggesting, obviously, because we've given them a four-year contract... What you're measuring against is where you would expect Spurs and hope Spurs to end up the season after next to be still here yeah, in relation to being no, in Europe, right? It's better, isn't it, than Scottish? Is, is yeah, I'm measuring it against the level of competition that we would expect in the Premier League. We're a Champions yep. League team. Most of the teams in the top six, top eight are Champions League level teams. So even your Chelsea's, uh, your Arsenal's, your Man United's, your Man City's, there's literally 14, there's, t there's literally six, seven, maybe eight teams of a European pedigree that are fighting for top four spaces. Even the ones that don't make top four, top six, they're Europa League standard. Then you've got even your Aston Villas, your Brentfords. These are the teams that literally could be playing in Europe, should be playing in uh, of that level. So when I looked at Celtic, I can't really measure them. Let's be honest. Let's call a spade a spade. We can't measure Celtic in terms of the pedigree that they play against because there's only one other team in that league that is decent, and that's Rangers. So when you measure Celtic, you should measure them against the teams that we would A, be beating or trying to beat uh, of a level that we can understand and really, you know, hold a yardstick to. So that's European football for me. So, yeah. So like I said, his Europa League record wasn't great. Uh, they played six uh, and uh, they, they won three. They lost Pat, three. I, what, what I'll say to you, Pat, we're, uh, we're going to come on to discuss his, obviously, his credentials in terms of what he's won, his style of play ultimately the recruitment process in general. But I think the key message that many will want to know from you is that ultimately, how quickly could he win you over? It's probably a key question to ask you. What does he need to do in order to make you believe that he is the right man? And this is this is my point, And it's not just me. I think this is uh, a lot of people I feel are being fake with the appointment. And because maybe they're just ground down, they understand what happened last time. They're just happy that someone's in. But when it actually breaks down and we start to watch them play week in and week out, if he's not doing well, how many of these people that now are saying, oh, back the man, get behind him, how many of those are going to really still back the guy and get behind him? I didn't, I didn't want a manager who was only five games away from a catastrophe. And I feel that with this level of manager, that's what it is. So if, uh, if, if it goes two, three, four games and it's quite sticky and then we take a batter into, say, Man City, Chelsea or even Arsenal in the fifth game, I guarantee it's going to get toxic. I wanted a manager who, even if things did get sticky, we would believe in them because we know that they're of a certain ilk or certain calibre. I don't know. Yeah, if it's right. along, yeah. But just, yeah just I mean, what, what, balance, what? Just brings in balance yeah. here, if I can. Like, and I'm not arguing with you, mate, because it's your opinion. But in terms of like, like, like the, you know, the fake or getting behind them, you know, whatever. If Potticino come in, who was my 100% first choice, and he'd have lost them games that you just reeled off. We are so starved of success and starved of, of anything nice over the last kind of four or five years. I think it's going to be hard for any manager coming in. And that, I think that's the bigger point. I think I don't think it's maybe the manager appointment. I think it's the, the board and the club appointment, the vision and the, you know, the stuff that we could talk about before, because actually that's what that's feeding into, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Like if you break that, like I love your breaking down and the statistics. I think it's it's fantastic the research you've done. And if you if you if you take away the, the CV, like what he's achieved, what he hasn't achieved, take that away for a second and think about what Tottenham actually need right now. What do these players need? What did what does the fans need? What does the football inside of this club need? And it needs someone. This is just my opinion, so feel free to kill me on it clearly. But what we need is a togetherness and something that's going to bring us together. And he has got that in his massive abundance. That is one of the key qualities he's got. Uh, everything I've read and watched and listened and all of these things that everyone is talking about, that is what Ange brings to the table. And it might not be good enough to get us, win us the Premier League in three or four years' time, but it sets us on our pathway. D does that make sense? So, you know, I'm not saying it's an interim appointment. I was also surprised it's a four-year contract. Pleasantly surprised. But I, I think that... I, I think that Personally, I think that right now Tottenham need somebody to come in and galvanise everybody together. And and I think that's what he brings more than, like, crackers, you made the point earlier in what you're making, 
uh, Patrick now is that that technical pep ability that or that um, Gallardo ability or you know like a Nagelsmann ability. You know the the thing that that I quite like about this appointment against the Nagelsmann as an example is that Nagelsmann wanted to come in and and buy a top top draw players on 300 grand a week, you know, and, and we can't do that. Regardless of if we agree with that or not, we don't do that and we can't do that. And 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 Poch didn't need to do that and that's why he worked. And Mourinho needed it and that's why he didn't work. And Conte needed it and that's why ultimately why he didn't work. And Ange doesn't need that. And uh, do you see where I'm coming from? So I know that we might not like that, but our club is, uh, in, until these owners move on, if that's what they're going to do, that's that's what we're like as a football club. So there's no point appointing a win now manager or somebody who's 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 got that technical ability or come up. You know, look at Gerard. Um, it's been said in the comments. You look at some of these younger men. Look at Frank Lampard. Like you know, just because they're young. Look at Vincent Company. He might he might get relegated next season. Like the, the point being is we don't know. But what we do know is that uh, Ange has got the qualities, in my opinion, that 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 we need as a football club it's soft qualities it's it's soft skills it's the behaviors it's the values piece more i think our club need that more than the technical win now that's what i think and that's why i think it's a better appointment potentially than some others that were out there does that make sense yeah, yeah absolutely does sorry i was just wondering i think like i mean the ages is the fact that he's 57 58 soon that's great he comes with experience obviously we know about his pet talks how he gets you know, players riled up, how he puts an arm around people. In terms of tactically, he's actually a lot better than people think he is. So, but the problem is, is that the level that he's coached at, I'm a bit sceptical if that's going to be enough to get us yeah. where we need to be. That's, that's the problem. So, and then, so like, to be fair, like I said, I compared his record in Europe to see where it's at. And again, in the Champions League this year, he didn't win a single game. So he, he drew two games he lost, uh, sorry, he lost, yeah, he drew two games uh, and lost four. And again, I mean, I can go into it better uh, in, in, in greater detail maybe later on, but yeah, I am a bit worried about the pedigree of him. We'll see. Um, yeah. That's, yeah. That's can, can I just say, I mean, again, this is what makes last one on Spurs for me, you know, ultimately I believe one of the best, you know, in my opinion, one of the best fan channels out there in relation it to Tottenham. It is Hotspur the because, best, Rick. Come on, say it. <laughs> because no, because in, my, in, my, in, my, in, my, in my opinion, you know, the whole point of this is, is that you want to bring on fans that have a genuine connection to the football club. And it would be boring if we all felt the same. And for those that are saying, get behind the manager. But if somebody has an opinion then they're absolutely well within their rights to voice that opinion. They should not be shouted down because they don't agree with the rest. And I think that is what this show is about. What I do just want to say before Morgan cracks in is that he leaves Celtic after winning uh, a successive premiership titles in two seasons. He spurs his fourth permanent manager since Maurizio Pochettino led us to the Champions League in 2018-2019. He, of course, follows Nuno, uh, Nuno Spinoza Santo, Jose Mourinho and Antonio Conte. The fact that he has signed a four-year contract, no matter what you feel does show a significant faith by Daniel Levy, who held his positive mentality and attacking football. He will, of course, begin work on July the 1st, but as we understand it, he will be consulted on all football-related decisions from this point onwards. He's a man that is a former Australian national team player. He managed at South Melbourne, winning the National Soccer League twice and the Oceania Cup Championships. He then not Australian national under-17s and 20s before moving on to managing the A-League, winning the Premiership in 2011, and the Championship Grand Finals in 2011 and 2012 with Brisbane Raw. Following that, course, he was the first coach to win consecutive A-League Championship titles as well. He then became the Australian National Manager from 2013 to 2017, taking that team to the 2014 FIFA World Cup, winning the Asia Cup in 2015, and securing qualification for the 2018 FIFA World Cup. He's had obviously a wonderful experience as well in Japan, and people are going to mock this. You know, It's up to them whether they mock this or not, but the man, wherever he's been, he has won. And in relation to what Daniel Levy has said, Cracks, to bring you in here, he says, now that the season and all domestic cup competitions have concluded, we are delighted to announce the appointment of Ange Postacoglu as our new first team head coach. He becomes the first Australian to manage in the Premier League. He will officially join us on July the 1st on a four-year contract. Daniel said Ange brings a positive mentality, a fast attacking style of play. He has a strong track record of developing players and understanding of the importance of the link from the academy. Everything that is important to our club. We're excited to have Ange join us as we prepare 
for the season ahead. And I do want to touch upon cracks with you, that four-year contract. If mm. you've seen Spurs' previous appointments before Pochettino, they weren't given anywhere near the length of that contract. So whatever people feel, this is a form of commitment. Whether it will last, obviously, who knows? That's the element of contracts that can be terminated at any time. But mm. going by Daniel's words, what do you take away from that? Well, contract length, I mean, there's a lot of devil in the detail with that. So, you know, just to try and bring some balance. If you're on a four-year deal worth £2 million a year, it's £8 million quid. But if you're on a three-year deal at £6, £7 million a year, like Jose or Conte would have been, then it's more money. So, I mean, the fact that he's got a four-year deal may represent a trust, but it may also represent that he's on the sort of money that isn't going to be too much to terminate. So you'd really have to know what sort of money he is on, um, which would give you a reflection of why he got why he got those four years. Look, we have to give the club the benefit of the doubt that he's on four years because they they're putting some trust into him and he's everybody's in this for for, for the long haul. Um, you know, Daniel Levy turning around and saying he plays a fast attacking uh, style of football, which Daniel Levy apparently said. Be nice to have Daniel on here this evening and ask who in that Celtic team impressed him um, with this fast attacking football that he's been watching. So, you know, it's, a, <laughs> it's it, you, you, you kind of get that, say something like this, you know. <laughs> Obviously, some, we all know somebody's written that out and they've gone, and Daniel's gone, yeah, that looks like I know about football, you know. It is, it's that Alan Partridge moment, isn't it? See the match <laughs> last night, which one? Don't know. It's, it's, it's one of those, isn't it, you know. So, uh, yeah, look, it, this all comes down to, Will he be a right fit? Will he be a round peg in a round hole? Whatever he's done before, <laughs> look, we've already seen with the last two managers, you bring in Jose, bring in Conte, you can't have any more pedigree on that. You know, you could have run them round the NEC during Crufts and they'd have had 50 rosettes stuck on them. That's, you know, that, that's how big their pedigree was. And how did that work out for us? So, to be fair with this appointment, perhaps this is just what we need. Perhaps it is a little bit of an arm round people, a little bit of silk and still. Um, but as we've seen, sometimes the great managers, they just don't work out at a club and they go somewhere else and they absolutely tear it up. Um, Unai Emery. Just couldn't like couldn't get a tune out of Arsenal, could he? Absolutely could not get a tune out of them. Now at Villa, he looks you take him all day long at your club, wouldn't you? He looks absolutely a sensational manager. So sometimes this isn't all about ability. It's like as Lee said, it's that feeling, it's that connection, it's that it's something away from football, that little human element where people buy into it and give you a little bit more. And I speak sometimes with Michael Dawson about this. And he said, like, when Harry came to Tottenham, um, you know, he says, uh, Michael Dawson says, look, I knew I was not going to ever get into any world 11 of defenders, but he just went and got, he could get that extra 10% out of me because I loved him and he believed in me and he just brought out that bit more and I wanted to run through walls for him. So can he, as I said at the top of the show, can he find a squad of players that actually want to do that? You know, and it's that whittling down period, that getting rid of those that don't and bringing in those that do is where 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 the bravery needs to be. It's every club needs more than just the manager. It's those those wheels, five or six of them, like like tractor wheels on a tank. Everybody has to be moving in the right way. If he gets some front foot football, he's going to get the majority of the fans on side, you know? So um, 
they, as I said, they need to be brave. When we do get a couple of cuffings, they, they will come whilst he learns the Premier League. Yeah. He's going to need the ball to be brave, you know, and we all start to feed into each other and we all start to move forward. If any one of those elements backs down, breaks, fouls, is not so brave, that's where everything fall da- falls down. I'm sure the fan base, even with their reservations, will go with it, will give him a chance. He'll obviously go for it. You know, he's that type of character. He'll have those players that want to go for it, will go for it. Will the board as well. Will the board back all his decisions? Will they they back those? Let me ask the ultimate question, Rick. If, if, uh, If Postacoglu goes in to see Daniel and says, I've had a chat and I've, you know, been speaking to Harry Kane for the last couple of weeks and we've been in training and I don't think he's getting me and I don't think he's really fitting into the team ethic here. I want him to go. And would they sell him? Would they sell him? Or Sonny? Or one of one of the big hitters? Would the club sell him? Would they go with that decision? That's that's the key thing, Crackers, that's, for me. That, that, that's, that's where it is. Because... And you know what? The, the the chairman has to say, okay, right? You're making the big call here. I go. I, I'm going with you. It, it has to. It has to be that level yeah. of all going with each other. I do just want to say. I, want, I do want to touch upon the style of play, and of course, the um, as as we've discussed, obviously the window ahead and what it's going to look like for him, and ultimately what he's going to be having in terms of obstacles and challenges during the job. But before I do, just a couple of super chats we've had in here. We've got Patrick McCory who says, love this A-team. Lee, hope you guys are enjoying the show. Please tell me the rumour and the story about the DM in regards to Harry Maguire potentially being a Spurs player. The thought of him and Dyer would put me in the coffin. Before Lee comments on that, um, we will come on, of course, to the summer window where we'll be discussing in general what the man might need ahead of the new season. Um, Alex Hutchinson here says, what won me over was the Socceroos team talk in which he was fantastic in, which you would have heard actually in the beginning of this show for our listeners and audio. He says, bring on the Ange days. Bring on the Ange days. He's winning me over. Good show, by the way. Uh, Brisky says, we must be patient with Ange. It's not like the last two who brought now win mentalities. It will take time to sort the ins and outs and playing style. Please, please back him. And Mia says, and we'll go to Pat on this before we discuss some of the quotes that have come out. A question for Pat. Who did Pat actually want? Did he want Pochettino? Did he want a Renap or Yol? And why are you so sceptical? I feel you're being harsh as the club we are right now in terms of the reality where we're at. Pat, do you want to answer that one very quickly? Yeah, I mean, I think she's talking about when Poch, Renap or Yol came in. Did I yep. want them at the time? Yeah. Uh, obviously not. But what's, what's that got to do with now? I don't get the two and two don't correlate. They don't mean that. You know, five plus five doesn't equal 10 in those scenarios. In terms of before, a lot of people in the comments saying that I'm being cowardly. I think I'm actually being quite brave to speak my mind. And you, go absolutely and are. you absolutely are. And I you're... can easily just happy clap and go along with what yep. everyone is doing. Spot on. But I'd Absolute rather speak on. my truth and speak my mind and voice my concerns and reservations because I'm sure there will be yep. others who will also feel like that, but maybe yep. a bit too shy to voice that. Secondly, I don't. I didn't need a win now manager to, to get behind him. And is here. I will get behind him regardless. He's been appointed. Why would I not get behind him? But it doesn't yep. mean I can't voice my concerns and my frustrations regarding it. And in terms of who I did want, I wanted someone who fitted the profile, was a younger manager, plays attacking football still, which Ange does, but probably a managed at a higher level. So your Nagelsmanns, your Galados, your Ruben Amarins, your Deserbis, people that are tried and tested and at the level that we know that we want to be at. Ange has got a lot to deal with. He's got a lot to do. I mean, for, you know, I, I, I hope and pray that he can get it right. He's obviously got a lot of incomings and outgoings. He's also got to get the style right. He's got to understand the players. He's got to understand the culture. He's got to get to grips with a league that is a lot tougher than the SPFL. The last two or three managers that have come over from Scotland, what's happened to them in the Premier League? They've fallen by the wayside. These are things, these are my concerns. So, you know, of course I'm going to get behind the manager. Why would I not? I want the best for him, which means the best for Spurs. I want us to be successful. I want us to go on and win things. I want to be, you know, I want to enjoy the football at the ground because for the last 
No, it will be it will be disingenuous to say that the last six months of the back end of last season or two seasons ago wasn't good. Under Conte, when we finished our in the top four, we were playing some good football. We definitely were. We were going to lead scoring four or five, you know, scored five against Norwich at the last game of the season. We were playing good football. But this year, oh my God, it's been horrible. So of course, if anything's better than that. But still, let's not pretend or forget where we are. We are a big club. We should be doing good things. That means ideally a top six finish. I just wonder if we can do that under Ange and then obviously get, you know, do... Yeah, there's a lot. There's, there's a lot going on. And Pat, but... listen, I think the one thing we always want people to do when they come on here, viewers, listeners, contributors, we want them to speak their truth. It wouldn't be fair to bring you on and ask you to change your opinion. I remember this is a good thing that it's come up because many ask, uh, our guests actually ask prescribed hand what they can and can't say. Well, hopefully this doesn't send a message out there that whenever you are coming on to last one on Spurs, yeah, hey, everybody speaks their mind. There is it. no pre-meeting. We have a green room within five minutes before we go on. And that is the nature of this show. Um, Shan says, and we have more money to spend at Spurs in comparison. Better players with attributes and he can make the step up in this league playing this way. And yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see, of course, how he does do. A couple of really nice managerial quotes on this. And said upon leaving Celtic, they wanted me to extend my time at Celtic. And while I'm so respectful and understanding of their position, a new opportunity has been presented to me. And it is one which I wanted to explore. I thought what was a lovely message was actually from the Football Australian um, national team, which said Football Australia is delighted to extend its heartfelt congratulations to the renowned Australian manager, Ange Postacoglu, on his appointment as manager of Premier League Giants. Premier League Giants, Tottenham Hotspur, isn't that lovely to hear? The appointment is a personal triumph for Ange and his family, and we're absolutely delighted for him. Ange personifies the Australian football story as a proud Greek Australian who immigrated to Australia at a young age and found his place in a new Australia through football. After making his name for himself domestically from his playing days at South Melbourne Football Club to his success at Socceroos head coach, leading the team to Asian glory in 2015 on home soil, and has gone on to test himself successfully in the global football arena against the world's best. This new chapter at Spurs for Ange is a testament to his enduring determination, skill and vision as a leader. It's also a great moment of great pride for Australian football. The CEO of Celtic actually said, we wanted Ange to stay with us. And while there's a real disappointment that we are losing with him, he has decided to take up this new challenge, which we do respect. And look, I think the one thing that is the common factor, if you've listened or watched any podcast relating to Ange Postacoglu or Celtic in the last two seasons, is that there is this almost idolisation for the man wherever you go and watch and listen to him. So regardless of opinions, fan opinions or whatever, you make your own judgment. You go to that stadium and you watch his brand of football and you see the results we've got. Cracks, we're going to come <clears> over <throat> to you. In terms one of the thing, man- Rick. Sorry, one thing before you start. Uh, the Giants of the Premier League, Tottenham. You damn straight we're Giants, OK? All right. Might not be at the moment, but this is a giant football club, OK? It's got a rich heritage it's got a rich history it's got it has got everything it really has this is a big football club make no doubts about it okay not lost its way a little bit in the last sort of 20 years but be under no illusion what makes a big football club that's not getting some sugar daddy coming in and just throwing money at things it's about i i could it's, it's the iconography of it and this club has got it in bucket loads, absolute bucket loads. We're, we're still a bigger club than Man City. We always will be a bigger club than Chelsea. This is one of the giants of British football, Tottenham. So, yeah, we are we are giants. Might be having a nap at the moment, but we are a giant club. Sorry, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I just run something past you then? You know, like, because obviously I believe we're a giant club. I fully want, wanted more than Ange. I believe that we should be demanding more as fans right now. But I feel that the fan base has almost been lulled into a sleep by Daniel Levy. Sometimes the way we operate, considering we're one of the richest clubs in the world, we're the most profitable football club in the world, we continuously top the, you know, the, the money list. We have billionaire owners, but we're always acting like we have to operate on a shoestring budget. We can't you know, pay the wages for this person. We can't compete with these guys for that. When realistically we can. So it's almost like the fan base 
And don't get me wrong, rivals always throw it out as you're not a big club, you're sp- but we mm-hmm. are a big club. And I feel sometimes our fans need to act like that as well and demand more. And maybe that's why these comments are coming out, because even our own fans are settling for stuff which we shouldn't. That's fair. No, I, I, again, yeah. just quickly on that, I, I, I agree with that. I, I agree with what you've just said. I think the, pro- the problem is that's again, you've just elevated it back up to the problem isn't the point with Ange uh, coming into the football club. The problem is the board. Well, that that is the, and that is a different debate. To be fair, and like like you said right at the beginning, Pat, you'll get behind a new manager, but ultimately it doesn't matter who comes in. This is the point that I think Rick and I have definitely made on loads and loads of shows, and and crackers, you you've probably said it more than anyone else. The reality is, unless something changes, nothing changes. I think that's the exact words what crackers uses, yeah. and you know that, that's jumping back up to that piece. This thing on age, I just want to. I know you're going to crackers, right? But I got to bounce off in a bit. I've just been doing some blue book research here, and out of the managers that are in the top five leagues this season, plus everyone that's in the top European competitions, I couldn't be bothered to do in, individual domestic uh, uh, competitions either. Either won the, the Cups or in the finals. Four of their managers are below 50 in age, and the rest of them are all above 50. And Mendebar, Spalletti, Moyes, who's in the final, regardless of what you think, and Carlo Angelotti won the Champions League last year, are all over 60. And Jose Mourinho has won more trophies than, you know, I've had at dinners. He's also 60 as well. So I, I generally, and this isn't a thing at you, Pat, this is just a thing at the club coming out and saying it, we want a young manager. That's wrong. It's not about age. It's literally not about age at all. And also, for me, and this is just my personal opinion, as we're throwing them out there tonight, it's also not about a CV. It's not about track record. It's not. It is about what does a club need today, right now, and they do not need a Spalletti. They do not need uh, a Jose or a Conte. Right? They need somebody to come in and unite exactly what we're talking about right now. Right? Because we're not united, and that's what they need. And I think and could potentially be uh, be the uh, one of the best people to do that after Poch, of course. Cracks, let me come on to you. In this next, next half an hour, we've got quite a bit to cover, so I'm going to do my best to absolutely mm-hmm. try and do that. Cracks, look, I think the concern with this managerial search is that at times it felt alarmingly similar to 2021, of course, the narrative that the club were desperate to avoid. But it has taken, as we mentioned at the top of the show, 72 days exactly again to appoint yeah. a manager. You could argue this time around it has been much more consistent by the names in which have been mentioned in terms of the brand of football they want to play. Nagelsmann, Slot. Enrique, I've got to say one thing that none of these names to me have felt like a Nuno option where we were coming towards the end and absolutely fighting desperately just to appoint somebody. Whatever you think about Postacoglu, he does represent Spurs' values in terms of playing a brand of football that hopefully we can all get behind. He does not change his ways, his principles for anybody. I just want to ask you that appointing before a director of football, Many will say that's not ideal and it creates an accountability issue if things do go badly. But to pick up what Lee said earlier, you've got Levy and Munn that still have to get that call right. But the fact that Daniel is giving Scott Munn maybe leeway early on, does that give us at least hopefully an inkling that things are changing at the very, very top? Mm. (laughs) No, not for me. And this this is where my, my reservations are because... I've seen 22 years of them eventually meddling into things that they they simply don't understand. Daniel Levy is not a football man. There's very few people on that board that are football football people. Um, Look, they've obviously been getting a briefing from somewhere. Who or what, I don't know. They've... You know they've got a brief of a type of of manager that they want, and and you're right, they have gone for similar types of manager. The worry is where they've been turned down by some of the more um, experienced similar managers in that vein. Why why would that be? Why is it when they were presented with what their job task will be and the autonomy they might have to do that job? Was was we turned down? So that's that is that is a worry. It's I think really the the board do need, as we said before, they probably do need to now split and communicate that out as well. So that Mun Scott Mun uh, is literally the football chairman, 
and Daniel Levy and 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 the rest of that crew all become the, the club chairman, if you like, because these are big businesses now. They're more than football clubs. You, you, you might not like that, but they do have to be. If you want big, new, shiny players, then you've either got to go and find yourself somebody that's going to bankroll that um, within FFP, of course, because everybody operates within FFP and doesn't do any creative accounting, or <laughs> you you generate, uh, you know, you generate income by having concerts and the go-karting. And I, that's one thing I can't really get my head around is that people are screaming, oh, it used to be a football club over there because we got Beyonce there for five nights. Fantastic. Brilliant. As long as all the money that comes in from that goes into Daniel Levy and Daniel Levy goes, okay, Mr. Munn, here's what we've made this year. Here's your money. Go and run the football side of things. It's it's not not rocket science. That's where something's not quite right, you know. Because all of a sudden, Daniel seems it just seems that there's a knocking on the door from Daniel, and it's like, well, what's what's going on? What's going on? Why why are you playing him? Like, what, what's what's happening here? There just seems to be that meddling. So that that needs to stop, Rick. That absolutely needs to stop. Uh, stop. And I hope that Scott Munn does. Um, get that autonomy to make some decisions. Um, you know, we've often said, would somebody from the club love to come? We'd love to get somebody from the club onto the, onto a channel, onto here, and come and tell us the vision and tell us the plan. And, uh, you know, I like to think that we're fair and balanced and even in the views when we're just chatting generally. If we had a guest on like that, we'd ask, some tough questions, but we'd be fair and we, you know, we may even learn something or they might be able to even tell us something that we didn't know where we think that they're failing. But the, but the realities of it is that they just can't do that thing that is that we want them to do. You see what I mean? Just a little bit more, a little bit more openness. There's lots of wins that Tottenham can get now with this manager going forward, a little bit more communication, a little bit more openness, a little bit about where we see ourselves going over the next year, 18 months. So, you know, it's never, never too late to change. Will they change? I can't see it, Rick. I really cannot see it. And, uh, you know, I, I think it will be as ever thus until they go, to be honest. I've got still a lot to cover. I want to cover this style of play, the rebuild, and how the winner's going to affect things. So, Pat, I'm going to try and bring it on to you and talk about the style of play. His mantra at Celtic is, we never stop, or was we never stop. He is known for playing a relentless, attacking style of football, but for many, it's thrilling. I think we made this point off air that ultimately, he does maybe need a kind fixture list to begin with in order so those fans that aren't fully on board with this appointment do give him the time that he needs in order to rebuild this football club. At Celtic, Pat, he predominantly played a 4-3-3 with inverted fullbacks overloading the midfield and two wide men staying high and coming inside or providing crosses for the centre forward and midfield runners. What I do want to ask you, Pat, is it's a brand of football that many, many Spurs fans will love. They'll relate to it. I just wonder how you feel he's going to get on with actually imprinting that playing style on this current squad and whether you do feel a lot has got to change in order to actually get results with the brand of football he would like to play. Yeah, the brand of football that you'd like to play is exciting. I mean, I've seen, I'm sure everyone's seen the videos, him saying, don't pass backwards, screaming at players, telling them, you know, never stop. Uh, we don't get tired. I've seen quotes where he's like, I don't, you know, I don't tolerate laziness. If I see you're being lazy, you'll be out of the squad. So all these things really tick the right boxes. Like you said, he plays a 4-3-3. So realistically, you're going to need two ball play and centre-backs that can also defend. Um, he likes to push high as well. He likes to play in, in, in the opponent's half and in the opponent's final third. So that means we'll be playing a high line. So we're going to need speedy and quick defenders because obviously when you get caught out in possession and they ping that ball over the top, you're going to need people that are able to react and also play, you know, 1v1 uh, defending, jockey someone to the side. That means also the full-backs have got to be able to defend because you're defending with four as opposed to five. So 
the personnel that we have right now, we're going to need a lot of bodies. We're going to need a lot of quality as well. We need someone to partner Romero. Defensively, Emerson Royale is a very good, uh, what is it, right back. But def uh, offensively, Poro definitely ticks a lot of boxes. So we're going to have to decide what goes on there. Then you've got the young guys, Spence and Adoji. Do they come in? Do they play? Will he get the minutes? We've seen that he does like to link. Uh, he does like to use uh, the youngsters. He does like to link the youth to the to the first team. So that's a positive. We're just going to need, again, we're going to need an attacking midfielder as well because the creativity is probably going to come from the midfield of the park as opposed to the fullbacks bombing forward and whipping in crosses. So we are going to need a lot of players that to fit his system. And, you know, one of the things that I did like is the length of the contract because it signifies to me that he will be given time. But what we also need is funds. We need players in and players out ASAP. So if these things do happen, then it's fantastic. And of course, I want him to be successful. I want him to do fun. I want him to be the best manager we've ever had. I want to love this guy more than Pochettino. Yes, I've got my reservations. Yes, I'm going to throw all of that to the side as soon as the first uh, whistle is kicked. And I'm going to get behind him. And like I said, I mean, Poch is gone. We have to forget him. He's over down in Chelsea. We need to get behind this guy and love him. And hopefully all those reservations and doubts will, you know, be singing his name and, and getting behind him and, and just loving what he does and how he talks to us, the fans, how he brings the players together. And hopefully the brand of football will be something that we can at least enjoy. Even if we do lose a couple of games, if we can see that the intent and the philosophy and the idea is right, uh, we can get behind that. Because even like at the end, Ryan Mason, you know, bless him, he, he looks like he could be a good manager in the long run. We could see that what Mason was doing. Some of the games, it didn't work out, but at least we gave him that time because we could understand what he was doing and what he was trying to build with. And that would be the same with uh, Postacoglu. Obviously, we hope it's a bit better because he's more experienced. But yeah, that's my kind of thought process behind it. Yeah, Pat, there's already comments saying you're already coming around to him already. Can I just say, <laughs> I, I, I want to say, I, again, <laughs> I, I want to make this point. I, honestly, Joe, I praise anybody that can come on and go maybe against the grain and have the courage and conviction to not only have an opinion, but back it up with hard, cold, hard, cold facts. And Pat's done that on this show. And that's why Pat is a regular on last one on Spurs. He gives his opinion. He's love for his opinion. So again, I will say, don't attack the person, attack the argument. And again, Pat has made so, valid points. Just, add, for this. Just, just quickly, I don't think Patrick's going across against the grain at all. I put a Twitter poll out like literally a week ago, and every seventy percent of them didn't want Ange coming in. There, there, you, there you go. Pool. There you go. You know I mean, like, I don't think it's. I just think it's the way the club is. You know, yep. at, at, at the end of the day. So like, fair play, man. Let's not worry about it. Like, yeah. people Liam, really disagree Liam, with Pat. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. It's just an opinion, Pat. Yeah. You're the top man, mate. We love you. We do love him, Liam Codgers. We've got you. We've got. We're gonna. We've got limited time here. I want to ask yeah, you, Liam. Four Lee, minutes for me, mate. <laughs> four minutes. Okay. Um, um, Rick, minutes. Rick, you couldn't even ask Lee's date of birth in four, four minutes. minutes. <laughs> mate, <laughs> he, he couldn't ask me. I could tell you it. Um, actually, just before you ask me his next question, I just want to go back to something that Crackers was talking about in terms of the board. So I think it's really important when you look at the board structure. Right. When you look at it, this is really important. We, we talk about Brighton, we talk about Arsenal, we talk about Man City are the, are the ones. The, the common theme here is that you've got Tony Bloom, who's the chairman right, of Brighton. Then you've got Paul Barber, who's the CEO. Right? Are you still with me? Keep keep with me. right? Then you've got David Weir, who's the director of football. And then you've got the Zerba, who's the manager. Right? There's four people in that, in, in the structure. Okay. You go to Arsenal, you've got Kronke, who's the chairman, you've got Venkate Shan, who is the CEO, you've got Edu, who's the director of football, and you've got Arteta, who's the manager. What's the common theme here? Right? The number four. Okay, let's go City. You've got Khaldun Al Barak, who's the chairman. You've got uh, Feren Sormoon, who is the CEO. You've got um, Birkenstein, I think might be leaving, but he's a director of football. And you've got Pep, who's the manager. What's the common theme here? Four. You have Tottenham, you've got Daniel Levy as the chairman and then the manager, and you might have a director of football. So are you deliberately, are you deliberately no leaving that Donna Cullen there, Lee, very quickly? Donna Cullen very quickly. I mean, it feels like she's got quite a high... Well, right. she's, 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 the C, she's chief executive. She's got a, a higher role there. She's not a chief executive. She's a, is an executive director and not a chief executive of the football club, right? And, and that's the point I'm making is Scott Munn's come in. He's the mm. chief footballing officer or the chief executive side of the foot, of the football club. And I think that's why you have to start to look at them structures. Uh, you know, most of the, the people that we've just talked about there, when, again, look, go and listen to the uh, Paul Barber 
on, on Jake and Damien's show, the High Performance Podcast, he talks about all of the stuff that he does operationally as a business, not even real too much on the football side of things. And I just think that that's what we've been missing in the in 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 the structure of the board, and that's what they're trying. Hopefully, we're going to see that they're trying to put that right with the appointment of Scott Munn. That was my point. That's fair. Lee, look, he's a great communicator and he has that ability to get others to buy into his vision of how the game should be played, which was a clear well, example of what he did at Celtic. You know, there was a real need there to replenish, rejuvenate a squad. And that's exactly what he'd done. I think what's quite interesting about him from what the research I've done is that he's not a man that ever gets really that close to the players. He's not like a Maurizio that is almost becoming a family member or like their dad. He's a man that will deliver a message clear, succinctly to the point, and every player will know exactly what they need to do. So I'm really keen to know from you, Lee, the fact that obviously Spurs have spent the last 10 weeks searching for Conte's successor and all the names that have been linked. How do you feel he's going to deal with that dressing room in terms of the job in hand, number one, Harry Kane's future? And how much could this impede already on the job in hand? He's got Hugo Lloris, his club captain that said he wants away already publicly. This obviously festival with Harry as well. How will he deal with that, Lee? How do you expect that to go this summer? Well, again, we're talking about research and we're talking about all the stuff around um, uh, uh, Ange, of course. Funnily enough, that's exactly the environment he walked into at Celtic. It's literally exactly the same. He had his club captain that wanted away. Uh, he had you know, star, some of his star players that were leaving and mo- moving on. Um, they'd just been absolutely ruined, I think, this, the season before by Rangers. Uh, I think it was a 26-point swing. We've just had a 22-point swing, uh, swing with our locus, uh, local rivals with Arsenal. So he's walking into a, a very similar scenario, um, uh, you know, in, in terms of, managing that side of the 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 um the, the game if you like um i think you know I, I can't comment on what i think he's gonna do because i don't know him but i think what he should do or what he needs to do is what cracker said and what i said on the last show which is you go and have a one-to-one with all of your playing staff there's 37 of them um so he's got a lot of work to do 37 first team players on the books at the moment and you sit in front of every one of them and if the words come out of their mouth i'm not sure i'm not quite sure i want to be here they're gone. Simple as that. And it doesn't matter who it is. And that, if that is that Hugo Lloris and all, all of that stuff. And Crack, as you mentioned earlier about you can't get rid of everybody in, the, in that one window. But for me personally, I'll be prioritising the people that do not want to be part of this train. So if you don't fancy it, you will be going. Like regardless, if you're Pedro, Pedro Porro, if you're Harry Kane, if you're Richarlison, if you're Romero, it, it, that that is the key thing, and, and actually, if Tungai and Dembele walks back through the door and actually convinces um, Ange that he wants to be here and he wants to do the business, that for me is the number one thing. Then you work on everything else. So attitude again, coming back to attitude, behaviour. Everybody's heard that uh, that 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 piece around you know talent and, and and attitude. You've got to have the right attitude first before you can let your talent shine. Um, so that would be the first thing that I would be doing. Obviously, I'm not telling him how to do his job. He's a lot better than, it than me, but that's what I'll be doing. The minute you start compromising, Rick, on, oh, well, you know, Romero doesn't really want to be here, but I ain't got another central defender, so I'm going to keep him. That's when the problems start, and that's when he's not going to be able to fix this problem. Correct. Right, coming over to you. Uh, he has spoken about his love, Postacoglu, for the challenge and to build something from scratch. He said, just about every job I've had has been an extensive rebuild. Usually when you come in when people are needing a change, secondly, the way I get my teams to play is challenging and requires a major shift, usually both in terms of playing staff and the way we work. We actually saw at Celtic the way he did exert that control over a number of areas. And don't forget the fact that the rebuild that he saw was Rangers actually finished 25 points ahead of Celtic in the previous season and reached a European final in that first Scottish campaign. And he did very quickly win over the respect of of those players and he did foster a culture of togetherness and he has you know been renowned for having a real good knowledge of the Japanese market he added six players during his time there at uh, the best being Kyogo Furuhashi who arguably you know he cost around 4.5 million and was the bargain of all the signs that he's ever made during his career he hit the ground running he obviously took Joe Hart as well a man that we may be a thought had finished and obviously embedded him into the squad as well as Cameron Carter Vickers who I know many had their views on. So I'm really intrigued to know to you, really intrigued to know from you, Cracks, in terms of the rebuild, mm. do you think this man is ready? Because it's a big, big summer in store. Lee references there 37 players he's got to manage and work with. Can he yeah. do it? Can he do it in one window? 
Well, you know, it, it looks like he's got the chops to do it, but he's now got to do that in the Premier League. This isn't the J League. This isn't the Scottish Premier League. He's got to sort this mess, get those players on board, get some out, get some in, and then guess what? On Saturday, you're at Man City away while you're doing this. You're not at Full Kirk away or you're not at Grampus 8 away. You're at Man City away. And then that week, you've got to take training and you're still sorting that mess out and doing this. And then guess what? You've got Man United at home the following Saturday. Lee, all the best. Good man, top man. Um, and then carry on that week, infusing the players, trying to get them to play for him. And guess what? The following week, you've got Arsenal away. And then you've got, and then you've got, and then you've got. So you've literally, you know, you've got a rebuild, which, as I said, he's shown he can do. But this is the Premier League. It's a huge step up. It's a unique league. It's the hardest league in the world. It, it really is. It may not be the best. Where I, where I live, La Liga, the technical ability of it is miles, miles in front. But it's nowhere near as exciting. It's nowhere near as competitive either. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of teams. You you ain't going Brighton away and skittling them anymore. You ain't going Brentford. You ain't going Villa. Every game, every game is tough. And and getting on with doing this rebuild as well. So you know, this is going to come in fast, really fast. And all we do is we hope and pray that he has got the cojones for it, R really do. But, yeah, it's all about whether he is ready to do the two things at once, to manage what he's got, siphon out what he doesn't need and get a tune out of players. Some of the, as I said, you know, you're not going to get rid of somebody like 15 players. So you've got to manage them and get a tune out of them whilst doing that so that you can go and get results at Villa away, and Man City, and Man U, and Liverpool, and every damn team in that league, because there is no easy games, and that's that's going to be the, the real test for him. One thing for next season, Rick, that I, that I really want to see, and nobody, but nobody, is winning that league other than Man City. Next year is already done. All the time that they've got Pep there, they're winning that league. So, Forget the league. We're not even not even close. Even if Pep wasn't there, we're still not winning that league. It's just it's just not happening. It's that that's Man City's like I, I don't know. Then the Premier League needs to be careful because they could lose what makes the Premier League if they become too dominant. I mean, they're they're an incredible team to watch. They're winning that league. If we start going to cup games and seeing players left on the bench because we've got a league game on the Saturday and we're not having a full tilt at winning one of those two cups on offer to us next season, I will be absolutely furious because even with everything going on, we stand a good chance of getting deep into either one of those two competitions next season if we throw the players yep. out That's what I want to see. I want to see some good, feel-good factor come back and some good football come back and have a go at them cups because we're just not winning that league. I don't want to see this. Yeah, but, you know, if we finish a couple of places, uh, six instead of eighth, it'll be worth more than a cup. Not to me, it's not. Not to the fans. It's about time we got something that suits us fans and not the club and the bank balances. That's what I want to see next season. That'll be interesting to see what we do in the Cups. It will do. I think many of us are, of course, waiting, and it might be for our listeners and audio, this might have already come out. We're, of course, waiting for that first interview from Ange, where I think many will then feel maybe a connection to begin with. And I just wonder, Pat, that's probably the key thing I want to ask you before we discuss and finalise and conclude on season predictions. How important, Pat, is that very, very early on to try and get a resonation and almost a connection with the supporters in terms of what's going to come out of that man's mouth? Because let's be honest about it, the last couple of managers that we've had in the greatest of respects to them, or the last two or three, 
Jose, Antonio, and of course, Nuno. In all of their facets and their ways, they really, I would say, struggled. Maybe Conte did it in periods, especially the early part, to really find a connection with the supporters. But this man, the brand of football, could already bring people on side. Of course, we say it's not going to happen overnight. But just how important is that word, Pat, communication, to really form a bond with fans early on and get them on side? Because if I, list, if I think back to Martin Yol and even Maurizio Pochettino, the one common thing those guys did have was a great way of being able to interact with the fans to acknowledge how big a job it is to manage Tottenham Hotspur Football Club, how proud they were, how prestigious this club can be with going in the right direction. How important could that be, Pat, to get that on side early on? Yeah, that's key. And that's why I think he will shine. Because, you know, for me, Pochettino is the man that I've loved the most uh, as a manager and probably one of my favourite people in Spurs, regardless of player or manager. And it's because of that connection and that bond that he had with us and the players. And I think Andrew will bring that because everyone talks so highly of him. You've seen all the welcome to Tottenham tweets or, you know, I'm sad that you're leaving. I've had play, uh, I've had fans interact from me, interact with me sorry, over the last couple of days, Australian fans, uh, Celtic fans saying how good of a man he is, even though, you know, they know I've made my feelings clear. So quite a few have also come out, uh, messaged me and said, I felt the same way that you did. Give him time. He will win you over. That's the, you know, that's the kind of guy he is. So I feel that he will do that because even when you listen to him talk, you know, the pep talks, even the way he talks to players, you've probably seen him doing the coaching, the mic'd up sessions. He's really good at getting his point across. He's really good at, you know, indicating uh, and letting people know where he where he's come from and what he's about. Like, you know, the quotes about how his dad was his favourite person and his dad was a working man and his dad never really showed him any love. So he was always working hard to get that, like, almost like that, that say so from his dad, that's you know, that nod of approval, that seal of approval. He's he's come out and said he's a you know, he's a honest man, a hard working man, he knows what honest day's work is. And that kind of thing will resonate with the regular everyday person because it feels like he's not out of touch with normal society. You know, some of these footballers and managers, the one thing that we always say as fans is that they're out of touch with the modern day, you know, with the modern person because they don't get it. You see, you feel already that he gets it. So, you know, uh, and yeah, I think in terms of man management and as a person, I think he is someone that we can get behind and, and ticks all the boxes. Obviously, you know, for all my reservations and doubts, there's one thing I won't do is I won't discredit someone and be disingenuous. And he does have a lot of things where he does tick boxes and definitely his people, his, his style, his charisma and how he how he brings people together. That is one of the pluses. And it does kind of give me those poch vibes uh, to a degree. Cracks, let's come over to you. You know, I think what's been very interesting is that when he was asked at the time of being Celtic manager, how he felt about not being the first choice. He said, you're assuming I was a second choice. I might have been the fifth choice. You never know. It really doesn't bother me. What's important is that I have been given the responsibility and the opportunity. And he just missed, you know, suggestions that he was making a jump in standard. And I think that's the one thing that's come across is that he's relished and taken on every single challenge that's come his way during mm. his career. And I mentioned this at the start in the most greatest of respects that he probably cannot believe his luck that he's been given the opportunity to manage this great football club. He will maybe argue he's earned it. He's had to work incredibly hard mm -hmm. to get this. And I wonder, even for someone like Harry Kane, who's been on a similar journey where he went out on loan seven or eight times, I wonder whether even that can relate to the players that ultimately this isn't a guy that's had it easy in terms of the silver spoon and also just been given opportunities, dare I say, like a Frank Lampard or Steven Gerrard. He's had to earn his right to be here. Do you think that's another reason, Cracks, why you feel if anybody's going to try and make this work and give it their everything, this is the man to do so? Well, I mean, every player there to a degree would have worked and sacrificed to become a professional footballer. So... They, they've all had sacrifice. You might not hear it all the time, but players, they all work incredibly hard and dedicate themselves to become a, 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 pro, a pro footballer. So it's all about whether his story resonates with the modern day player. You know, it's, uh, as I said at the top of the show, he's, he's, he is a bit of a throwback. He does feel like a bit of a throwback. And, you know, that was a wonderful speech 
that's been played out where he talks about taking the people with him as well. Um, but, you know, those people that pushed you on to become players when you was kids, you know, you take them with you. He takes says he takes his dad with him in spirit. And if he was sat in the stands and listen, that, that that's fantastic. That speaks to me all day long because I'm from an era when that was something. I'm not so sure whether it's what the modern day player buys into now as well, because as much as that speech he gave, there is also a flip side to that where Alex Ferguson walked into the dressing room at half time at White Hart Lane and said, lads, it's Tottenham Hotspur. And that's all he said. And they went out and gave us a good hiding. So, you know, and Poster Coglu made that speech and as Simon Jordan alluded to today, when he when it was played, he just turned around. He went, "That was a lovely speech, by the way." Australia nil, Peru two. So yeah. listen, you know, I, I think me and Patrick are, are, are the same. Same, we're leaning on the same open doors. Maybe coming it from it from different angles, but you know, it, it, I, I, he gets my absolute best wishes, and I, I like what he's what he's got to say. But it's not. I'm. I'm not. I'm not going out Saturday, and I'm not going out to win a game. I'm on the terraces, getting behind it. It's whether those players buy yeah. into it. I'd. I'd run through a brick wall for him. Um, will, will the players? That. That's what it all comes down to. That's the million dollar question. And if they do, Rick, and they do buy into it, and we do progress, and we are better, and then he demands a little bit of a better player or a new player or to keep going and refreshing going forward in these four years he's been given, when he goes and knocks on the board's door and says, I want this, will they go with it as well? Are, are they going to be brave? He's asking us to be brave. He's yep. brave taking this job on. He wants his players to be brave, to get on the front foot. We'll all do it. Will Daniel Levy? That's that's the big question. That's that's where I think this whole thing falls down. You know, we're we're looking to build another mansion. Will somebody get some furniture this time that a previous incumbent never got? There's the big there's the big million dollar question. This is key, right? I want to close it on this point. So after nearly four seasons of under counter punching managers for Tottenham, we've gone from the transition of a Poster Coglu possession based style which we're hoping is going to announce an amount in a lot of happiness in these next four years. We know, of course, there's no such thing as an overnight transformation. There's a lot of work to be done. It may be a slog, but we've seen sometimes that being patient does give you the best reward. So, guys, I'm going to ask you very quickly to sum up and give me your feelings on the back of where we are right now. And these might change throughout the summer. You guys are all going to be back on, of course, on Last Word on Spurs. If I was to ask you to predict the season... Ex- well, I was not want to say predict, but give me what the season expectations are, where we are right now going into next season. Pat, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to end on cracks. What is for you right now those season expectations? Uh, well, obviously, I want to see a better brand of football. Uh, we all know what Poster Cogley should come in and do. Uh, hopefully he's backed and he's given the players to allow him to at least try and cook up a recipe that obviously he can serve. We finished, what, eighth this season? Only two points behind Brighton and six. We all won the same amount of games in Brighton, Aston Villa and, and Tottenham. Uh, so ideally, with only playing once a week, I really want to see us go far in the Cups, like Crack said. And I want to fit... I think we should be finishing or aiming for a top six finish. I think that's realistic. I don't think Champions League football is realistic in this first season. Obviously, if it comes, we have to take it and then we will, you know, change our expectations as the season's developing. But realistically, a top six finish and a good crack at both domestic trophies. So I'd expect at least a quarterfinals in one of them and a top six finish. Um, It may sound a bit far-fetched considering the teams around us should improve, but then so should we. The fact that we've got a manager who will be allowed to outline his uh, tactics, uh, shape the team and mould it in his image, hopefully bring in a few players, get to work with them week in and week out and have a steady voice 
you know, and coach them as well. We had three coaches this season and that's crazy. That can't happen again. So with a bit of steadiness, uh, a good voice, someone that the, the players can enjoy uh, listening to and be around, I'm hoping to finish fifth or sixth and hopefully win a trophy, man. At the end of the day, that's what it's about. It's about trying to actually win something. But again, being realistic, at least the quarterfinals in one of the uh, cups. Pat, I want to say, mate, massive, massive thank you for coming on, being you, being true, and saying exactly how you feel. <laughs> you. You're caught back of us across the summer. We've got lots and lots of shows coming up on the last one on Spurs. Pat, where can everybody find you for the honest, hard-hitting opinions that we love you for? Yeah, so it's um, Patrick Tyrant, P-A-T-R-I-C-K, and then Tyrant, T-Y-R-A-N-T. And that's on Twitter. Oh, there you go, Twitter, Instagram. Yeah, follow me on there or, you know, connect with me. You can talk to me on there. And yeah, and obviously I'm on different podcasts all throughout the week. Of course, I'll be on Last Word on Spurs throughout the summer as well. So you can find me and yeah, here, there and everywhere. Top man. Love having you on, mate. Always. Cracks, let me close mm. with you. I'm going to ask you a similar question. Big, big job in store. Hugo mm-hmm. Lloris's future up in the air. Harry mm-hmm. Kane's future up in the air. Spurs, I'm sure, are going to be trying to shift players out on loan, of course. They're going to be trying to bring players in. On that basis of the chaotic summer, and the fact Spurs finished where they finished last season, as we alluded to, had three managers, interims, two of them. What is a realistic expectation, in your opinion, of what we should hope for ahead of the upcoming season? All we should hope for at the moment, this club is such a mess. It is such an utter chaotic mess from the last three appointments, which the board have badly got wrong or miss mismanaged, if you like, or not stepped up or taken the club in a direction with especially two of them, Jose and Conte. We never we never run the club in a way that fitted their philosophies. Um, and it's left us in this mess. Right now, next season, all I want to see is some identity back and I want to see some football I can get behind. Win or lose, that's all I want. If next season we end up in a lower position than this season, if we end up 10th, 11th, but I can see something being formed, coming together, I'll take that all day long because... Rick, I'm I'm 53, and I know from what some people have been saying, once you get a five on the front of your age, you're, you're past it, apparently. Let me tell you, at 57, I'm still going to be wearing spray-on jeans. Well, he said and, that. He said that. And, uh, <laughs> listen, yeah, I, I, I've seen the ageism, but don't worry about it. Like, I, I see you. I see you. Can I, make, can, I make you feel, can I make you feel better, Cracks? On the last three years of having two kids, I feel 107. Does that make you feel any better? <laughs> Try four, mate. Look, oh look let God. me show you something. <laughs> look at that hair. Look, that, that is that is Spurs and that is life. I'll ask you what, Sil- what is that Silver Spurs or Fox? That, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, hey, George, that's George that's Clooney. Four vibes. kids. George Spurs, Clooney. everything. That, that's that's the whole lot. <laughs> but but look, that's that's all I want. And if we do end up a couple of places lower in the league, but I can see something to get behind. I can see something that looks like Tottenham Hotspur. That's all I want. And I'll go with it because like some, funny enough, I think it's Rangers fans, funny enough, coined this phrase, which is quite ironic, given we've just nicked Celtic's manager. They said that when their club went down the pan, if Rangers played in the road, we'd watch from the pavement. And I would. But as long as I'm seeing something that represents my football team, and the football that I was brought up on, and some today is to do. That's all I want from next season. I just want to see going in the right direction. That may need that may need mean going back a couple of steps to go forward. I'll take that. I'm brave. I think Angie's brave. Is the rest of the fan base brave? More importantly, Daniel Levy, are you brave? Spot up. What a way to end it. I want to say a massive, massive thank you. Over two and a half thousand of you tuning in, viewing this show tonight. I can't thank you enough for all of your incredible support for last one on Spurs. Honestly, we've been joined by the wonderful Patrick Tyrant, the wonderful Richard Cracknell. Rich, very quick, I must ask you, any Legends Nights out there that people can still get their hands on? Father's Day is coming very, very soon. So it's a great time right now. If you're looking for a present for your dad, 
or for your granddad or for anybody that loves Tottenham. Cracks, any Legends event you want to give a quick mention to that's coming up? Tickets wise? Yes. End of the month, uh, there's Michael Dawson at Hereford Spurs, and there's some very, very limited tickets left for that. Uh, I should know these dates, shouldn't I? I think that's Friday the 24th. So take a look at my socials at Mr. Cracknell. I'll put that out. And then the one and only Danny Rose just into July uh, at, in Arnest Grove. So he's uh, doing an evening. I'll be speaking to him. That comes with a meal and everything. That'll be, that'll be, that'll so be, that'll be, a, that'll be a quiet one. That, yeah, that, that will that'll be. be that'll that be will be. That'll yeah, be it'll be a very, very good night yeah. and a bit of a one-off. So I'm really looking forward to that because Danny's got a story to tell. So that's uh, <laughs> Arnest Grove, North <laughs> don't, London, don't we, don't start we of July. It? Yeah, it's uh, close, in, close encounters dot events uh, for, uh, for that. So, or again, look on my socials and I'll, or get in touch with me and I can give you details of those. So uh, thank you for that, Rick. My pleasure. Well, listen, guys, we are going to be back with you quicker than before you know. It may cost me my marriage, but for you, I know you guys probably out there don't care. My wife does, bless her. We've got two that we're trying to deal with at the moment, plus a podcast. It's all happening in our house. It is crazy training. If Lee McQueen was to mention it, I want to say a massive thank you to Lee, bless him, who came on. Currently in Austin at the moment, managing the situation, and Cracks proudly shove his barnet there as to what Tottenham's done with him. But from Pat, from Cracks, from me, and from Lee McQueen, we've been the last word on Spurs. And for our listeners on audio, checking you out, is Tottenham Hotspur's new manager, head coach, and Poster Coglu. From all of us here at Last One on Spurs, please keep safe, keep well, and as always, come on you Spurs. <laughs>